Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club. Welcome to City Club and our third installment in this club series on keeping Oregon's promise. Today we will focus on economic development and job growth. Our panelists are Marty Brantley, Sam Naito, Debbie Coleman, and then Ethan Seltzer will be our moderator as he has been for this series. Of course, before we begin our program, I have a few items of club business. If you're not a City Club member, and of course you should be, today's a great day to join. During this series, the Keeping Oregon's Promise series, we'll be waiving the $25 sign-up fee. So it's a great day to join. You can uh, make your dues payments monthly or you can have them withdrawn from your checking account. Um, see a staff person today and, and sign up. Next, next Monday, November 10th, City Club New Leaders Council Arts and Culture Cell will be presenting a, a, an event called Arts as a Mean for Social Change. And the event will take place at Fernando's Hideaway with, uh, I'm sure, appropriate libations. Um, that's on 2nd Avenue. It will be from 6 to 7.30. And if you're interested or would like to RSVP, please see Nikki um, at the back table. The party to celebrate the 30th anniversary of admission of women to the City Club will occur on Monday, November 24th, on the first floor of City Hall uh, from 5.30 to 7.00. Join Mayor Katz, Gretchen Kafuri, and others as we hear some choice quotes about the role of women in society and uh, celebrate with music from the 70s and great food and drink, including hors d'oeuvres provided by Voila Catering. And please RSVP at the City Club office. Uh, now I'd like to uh, acknowledge Alexander Schweyun. Alexander, are, are you here? Is, what's he? Oh, there we are. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, Alexander has been our visiting research fellow from our sister city club in Vinitsa, Ukraine. Since arriving in Portland on August 28th, Alexander has been researching human rights practices, democratic institutions, and nonprofit management in the United States. Uh, he's used city club as his base for that, and he's attended classes at PSU and Lewis and Clark College, met with numerous public agencies and nonprofit organizations, and observed court proceedings in Oregon and Washington. He also attended conferences in New York and Los Angeles and all of this in just 10 weeks. I'd like to share with you uh, what I understand are his top four observations of life in Portland. First, uh, we have many opportunities to be active in public life and many opportunities for direct contact with government officials. Second, internet access and other information technology are fabulous as long as they work. Uh, <laughs> Third, Portland has a wonderful public transportation system that contradicts the widely held view overseas that in America you just have to have a car. And fourth, Americans are really truly time-dominated time dominated creatures. <laughs> anyway, today we bid farewell to Alexander and wish him success as he returns to Ukraine to implement some of the things he's learned in the United States. So farewell, Sasha. We're grateful for the time you spent with us, and we look forward to maintaining contact with you and your colleagues. Thank you. The broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Washington Mutual and Portland General Electric. We're very grateful for their support. So on to our program. During the roaring 90s, Oregon's job growth outpaced many other regions of the country, and we began to feel a little smug, about, smug and invincible about our state. We had found the formula for sustaining job growth and quality of life. How times have changed. For a couple of years now, Oregon's unemployment rate has topped all other states, and the pace of economic recovery continues to be slower here than in other regions. Our panel today will share their thoughts about the keys to job creation and economic growth in Oregon. First, Marty Brantley uh, will speak to us. He's been in the press frequently since Governor Kulongowski appointed him as head of the Oregon Department of Economic and Community Develop Development earlier this year, but in fact, most of his career was in the media. For 25 years, he was at KPTV, retiring in 2000 and pres as president and general manager. Previous jobs included work at television stations in San Francisco and Washington, D.C. At the Department of Economic and Community Development, Marty Brantley has redirected and reinvigorated the department and has made it one of the most visible parts of Governor Kulongowski's administration. Mr. Brantley's board involvement has included Lewis and Clark College, the Portland Art Museum, and Sisters of Providence Health Systems, the Association for Public Progress, and the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Portland branch. 
His numerous awards include Solve's Tom McCall Award and the Aubrey Watsick Award. Sam Naito hardly needs an introduction to this audience, but for a little review, Mr. Naito is president and CEO of the Naito Corporation, which includes Naito Properties, 12 Made in Oregon stores, and Norcrest China. Uh, Sam Naito and his family were key participants in the renaissance of downtown, and his influence on the evolution of downtown Portland continues in the current renovation and conversion of the Galleria into space for the Western Culinary Institute. Mr. Naito's civic activities are numerous, including roles on the boards of Lewis and Clark College, the Oregon Historical Society, and the American Red Cross. His awards include the Aubrey Watsick Award from Lewis and Clark College, the First Citizen, First Citizen Award, and a medal from the Emperor of Japan. Debbie Coleman has had a long and distinguished career in the high tech sector, including roles as Vice President of Operations and Chief Financial Op Officer for Apple Computers, Vice President for Materials and Operations for Tektronix, and as Chair and CEO of Merix Corporation. Most recently, she was founder, co-founder and is general partner of Smart Forest Ventures, a venture capital firm specializing in high-tech startups. Debbie Coleman is also active in numerous civic boards and is especially uh, involved in the arts. In March of this year, Governor Kit, uh, Kulongowski imported, appointed her to the Oregon Arts Commission. And finally, our moderator today is Ethan Seltzer, whom, as you may know from our previous uh, panels, is the director of the School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. So welcome to our panel. Well, thanks, Andy. Um, what we're going to do is each of our panelists will take uh, five minutes or so, maybe a little longer, we'll see, um, but you never know. Uh, to make some remarks, opening remarks. Um, we've got some questions and things that we'll use to try and uh, simulate some discussion among the panel members. And then what we'd also like to do is get some questions from you. And on your tables, there are some cards. Uh, and if you can borrow a pen from somebody, we ask that uh, you write your questions down on the cards. Um, just hold it up, and a City Club staff member will collect them and bring them up here to us. And what we'll try and do is integrate your questions um, into the discussion as we go along. It's a little different than a typical city club program where the microphones were kind of positioned on either corner. And what we'll try and do is uh, bring as many of those questions up here uh, into this discussion uh, this afternoon as we can. So with that, with no further ado, Marty, why don't you lead us off and thank you. see where we go. Thank you. And thank you very much for including me in your very informative series, Keeping Oregon's Promise. There have been some wonderful, insightful thoughts, and your series only reinforces that old adage that if you have a new penny, and I have a new penny, and we exchange pennies, you still have one cent and I still have one cent. But if you have a new penny and I, ha excuse me, if you have a new idea and I have a new idea, you now have two new ideas and you have two new ideas. Nine months ago, a new governor with a new administration embarked upon a journey that in business circles is called a turnaround. Oregon was not alone in that situation. 47 states were looking at decreases in revenue, the worst some say since World War II and the total for all of those states might exceed $60 billion. We need only to look in, at this past year to see the challenge that Oregon has had and that other states have also had. We are well along in this journey and I believe have stopped the revenue hemorrhaging in Oregon. Taxes that corporations pay in Oregon are running up 45.6% for the first quarter of fiscal 04 versus the first quarter of fiscal 03. And the withholding tax revenue is up 4.7% from the same period of a year ago. One of the huge declines for the state has been the average net worth of the people of Oregon. This has been going on for three years. Now remember, the top 10% of taxpayers pay over 50% of the personal income tax. With payrolls down and capital gains down, the state has taken a huge hit in the revenue side. But that is beginning to change as the net worth of the country has risen and for Oregon too. But that's just the beginning of the journey because we must make structural changes, structural changes in our economic picture if we're going to be better prepared for prosperity and for recession. If the last few years have taught us anything, it is that the economic health of our state is part of our livability that we enjoy. A strong economy can mean a strong educational system and a strong health care system. But without economic strength, we will not succeed. Our legislature has helped start the structural changes necessary with a series of steps. 
They've redefined PERS both economically and with new personnel, refocused our economic development priorities toward jobs and Oregon's economic health, created a funding source for the branding of Oregon nationally and internationally, and recognized that the lack of large tracts of industrial land has shut the door on companies that want to expand here. They have created a single sales tax which has captured the attention of many large companies and increased the research and development tax credits for companies that rely on Oregon for intellectual property leadership. Now these steps, along with the good work at the port and expanding our international air carriers, have started to send the word out that Oregon is interested in business and that businesses are interested in Oregon. We can do this within the context of what we most value, our livability. And in fact, we cannot do it without our livability. But we must act quickly because capital moves fast. And if you're not one step ahead, you are truly five steps behind. We've begun to turn around the state with better economic understanding, but we still have a long way to go. One of our friends in Seattle recently said of Oregon that it, quote, does not seem to have a coherent economic future at all, unquote. Well, we do have one one that many states would love to have, but we must appreciate it and nurture it into the future. And I think we can do that with your help. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? All right, yeah. fine. I'm happy to be here today and flattered to be with such distinguished company, but I have to admit, that I'm very nervous at this table of highly skilled speakers and business theorists because most of my last 55 years have been spent chasing after customers in hopes of getting them to buy something. Oh, I don't mean to put down logical planning. In my family business, we've always tr tried to make up plans like they taught me in business school before most of you were born. <laughs> but a lot of time, it hasn't worked. We'd be all beset for a crowd, and we're lucky to attract a couple. So we tried to think of something else, and times passed. We gradually found out we could do with success what we did couldn't. And I can't help thinking that maybe Oregon's problem is a lot, are a lot like that. Now, we're looking back on the fabulous 80s and 90s, but as I remember, things looked pretty bleak in 1970 as they do now. We need to recognize our future successes doesn't depend on specific plan so much as developing the right attitude. About 25 years ago, Oregon Business Magazine asked Norm Winningstad and me to write articles suggesting how Oregon could overcome the terminal slump that had overwhelmed our timber and agricultural industries. Norm had founded the floating point system, which was one of the most dramatic high-tech stories of the decade, and he made a strong argument that our future lay in the so-called silicon forest. Based on a group of people with ideas who had grown up around Textronics. Although that sounded pretty good to me, I agreed to make the case that our future lay instead of promoting our geographical location between relatively rich consumers of the U.S and cheaper producers of the Far East. I said, our future lay in high trade and not high tech. And I knew, as you know what, we were both equally right and equally wrong. <laughs> Both areas exploded over the following 20 years, and Oregon fully participated in a boom that swept across the, most of the country, bringing prosperity and a, and a long, feel-good era. Even now, in the midst of the high unemployment and squeeze services, the standard of living in Willamette Valley is surely much higher than has ever been before, and disposable income continues to gain. And retirees are often our most financially secure citizens, and anybody who owns a house feels rich. At least one generation would find it difficult to believe that there was life before Starbucks on every corner, Wild Oats in every mall. <laughs> I noticed yesterday that one of those fancy grocery stores is offering bread pudding, imagine, at $9.99 a pound, <laughs> which proves that we got a lot of prosperous new residents. 
And it seems to me we got there to here mostly by taking advantage of what came along, not by any genius plan. So I don't think I'm qualified to tell you what we can do to build a sustainable economic growth in the future. Most of the conditions that support such growth are frankly out of our hands. In my opinion, they're the results of national and international economics developments and the country's competitive standing, which isn't too strong right now. So instead of a blueprint, I like to put down a few simple suggestions of how I think we might con conduct business in Oregon more to our advantage no matter how economic cookies crumble. For instance, I'm disappointed that the Oregonians and maybe most Americans have lost a sense of economic community, which means doing business with our neighbors. And if you will forgive my pessimism, I frankly don't think that our country, our state's future prosperity lies in manufacturing basic goods and commodities for a worldwide market. We simply cannot compete with wage rates of the Asian giants, nor do we have to. But it means we've got to concentrate on supplying goods and services that cannot satisfy customers by price alone. We have the advantage of immediate availability, of convenience, and of high quality. And as some of you know, our family business has been testing the market with the appetite of Oregon-produced products for the past 28 years and we found a very nice niche. Did you know, for instance, that you had the choice of output from more than 200 Oregon wineries, many with world-class offerings? The same is true with many other food products, sportswears, and luxury items. And these are the, are the producers who should be given the state support to promote greater name awareness, to attract higher sales, increase employment, and nice flow of outside dollars. I know. It's this sounds like small potatoes. That, incidentally, another nice Oregon product. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I can't emphasize enough that just because a company or industry is not small doesn't mean that it won't become a growth engine for its community and its state when the right conditions develop. We need to ensure that struggling small businesses get the support, the purchasing power, of Oregon consumers and encouragement of Oregon State development dollars. But in a state as small as Oregon, there are only a limited number of those dollars and many old Oregonians are reluctant to promote big changes. I'm afraid I have to challenge the attitude because unless we commit ourselves to accepting, welcoming, and promoting stronger population growth than we've recently managed, we aren't going to have the capital to keep our proud standard of living. Did you notice how fast Oregon has grown in the past several years? About 1% per year, and in most medium-sized and smaller communities away from Portland, there's actually been a steady decline. This is not acceptable unless we want Oregon to become an economic backwater. That may be fine for some people my age, but sitting on the front porch as an occupation can't be much fun since the weather broke. <laughs> I think we need to create plans of how we deal with population growth that may be hard to swallow. For instance, we should seriously consider making transit free so most residents have an alternative to driving the streets which will become busier as we add population. And do you know the employers already pay the tax covering 80% of the cost of our buses, light rail, and trolleys? And covering another 20% will bring us a lot of benefits. But these are just a few examples, and there's others. Boosting tourism all over the state is another way to attract upscale dollars. And so are higher education programs aimed at overseas students. But uh, I'm sure you get my point of view now. Economic revival isn't a question of a killer plan or a silver bullet. It's starting from the bottom with everybody cooperating with to boost Oregon's existing businesses, our employment, our population, our prosperity. And I'm sure we can do it because we always have. Thank you.
don't have the uh, long personal history of my neighbor Sam here, and I'd like to actually echo quite a, a few of the comments that both Marty and Sam have offered this afternoon, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of a personal view. Um, I've been here in Oregon almost exactly 11 years. I came up from the Silicon Valley uh, to um, Silicon Forest uh, as part of a Tektronics management turnaround team 11 years ago. And uh, I've spent almost 30 years in the high technology industry, which in addition to a lot of white hairs um, and uh, obsessive compulsive behavior, um, <laughs> you know, I somehow have managed to survive um, as, an, as an immigrant sometime uh, to, to a new state or a new region, um, you can sometimes feel even more strongly than the natives about the positives and the wonderful opportunities and uh, milieu that you enjoy. And uh, I'm afraid that I really do enjoy, uh, starting 11 years ago, shopping at Made in Oregon stores, and I love the coffee shops on every corners and the wild oats, I have to admit. I am one of those uh, uh, high-priced consumers, and I try to contribute to the economy beyond just working that way. Um, <laughs> and, and this is a great place. And I know that some of the politicians aren't going to like this, but my friends love to visit here because of the no sales tax. <laughs> and they love to visit all our stores. So I try to bring those out-of-state tourism in here as much as possible. But when I first came up here, I left a three-year experience in Silicon Valley where we had experienced the worst downturn we had seen uh, to date, 1989 um, through 92. Uh, we were continually losing companies and operations and startups to regions like Austin, Texas, and Portland, Oregon. So several of us um, in the business and uh, in the public sector back in Silicon Valley got together. We had a public-private partnership known as Joint Venture Silicon Valley, and we focused on uh, software development in the Valley, the global trading center, the importance of uh, uh, Asian Pacific trade in particular. Uh, we focused on also uh, streamlining government regulations and um, permitting and those type of processes. Uh, we, uh, and we also, believe it or not, at the time, in 1989, 1990, Silicon Valley was one of the least wired and connected in terms of their schools. They had less personal computers in the classroom than just about any place else in America, and that was a darn shame. So we started a, a, a program called Smart Valley, and uh, that is absolutely no longer true there today. Something that um, followed on to those activities in the late 90s, um, after they succeeded in getting the economy uh, a bit on track, although it was followed by the internet uh, or dot-com bubble, um, they got involved in the arts as well, so they have a cu cultural initiative uh, following up to several of those initiatives um, down in Silicon Valley. So when I came up here, I actually thought Oregon had a pretty vibrant um, economy in the early 90s, and I got the opportunity to spin a company out of Tektronix um, and run it for seven and a half years, and unfortunately uh, lived, to, lived through a few more of the up and down cycles. Um, as we know, broadly, economically speaking, the world has gone from an agrarian economy to then an industrial economy, and now people like to call it the information age. But the fact of the matter is, you still need agricultural products and you still need industrial products like uh, cars and trucks. And the information age, it, the information technology, it's really just a, a means, it's really just a tool. It doesn't, I mean, there's the promise of nanotechnology where we can build things, a, a molecule or an atom at a time. But that's still a promise. Nobody's delivered on that yet. So all information technology really is is a way to help you build uh, better, uh, cheaper, less expensive food uh, and clothing and cars. So um, I'm, not, I'm not clear yet. I'm not a social historian or economist. I don't think we've worked through all the different ways that the information technology aspect of our economy is um, you know, affecting us. For example, we all know that the economy in general, the, in terms of gross domestic product, is increasing, particularly in the last uh, few quarters, but the job growth just hasn't been there. And one of the ways the economists answer this is that we've had huge productivity growth. All the companies that have cut back on jobs, they're finding that with fewer workers but more information technology, they can get more 
transactional type stuff done. So they're not adding the jobs as quickly as, as demand for goods and services increases. So I think there's some ways we, we haven't figured out um, you know, what the net benefits are from all this information technology investment, although my colleagues would probably kill me for saying that. Um, <laughs> I think I, I echo some economists like Lester Thoreau and others who are trying to study this phenomenon on productivity and economic growth. Um, myself personally, in the last few years, I've shifted to the venture uh, capital-based world and uh, work with folks uh, like Marty and the uh, Portland Development uh, commission here, which I think has some excellent policies that's helped me attract. I think nine out of my ten current portfolio companies are within the city limits because of some of the favorable programs and treatments we have here. Um, Portland State, um, one of my uh, startup firms is um, getting a lot of technical help from one of the uh, centers of excellence that they've set up in the engineering school there. I think there's a lot of promise um, from our um, levels of higher institution, OGI, OHSU um, in particular. Um, there are some new technologies which I think can be commercialized in coming years. So I, I don't exactly know which industries are going to be the net gainers. I mean, I think there'll be a resurgence of growth, um, hopefully, um, in some existing uh, sectors like tourism, uh, like the gourmet uh, wine and cheese and, and food um, industry. Uh, like our fabulous uh, athletic and out outdoor sportswear business, um, but also in high technology. But I, I think it will be in different areas uh, than we've seen in the past. We have some critical mass of telecommunication companies. Um, we have some critical mass of uh, display technology and uh, certain kinds of software, particularly the software that helps design um, integrated circuits. And of course, we have um, um, Intel here, I think one of our biggest uh, strengths in terms of an engine for future economic growth here in Oregon is the fact that we have more folks working at Intel Oregon than we do the combined sites of Intel in all of California, of which they have several major sites. And most of the advanced product development is here. So I think that helps make up a little bit for the fact that we're not graduating as many um, engineers with you know masters and PhDs as some of the other states. We're simply, you know, they're graduating them and we're hiring them and they're coming here and hopefully um, they'll be developing new products and technologies as we go forward. So I'm very, very um, optimistic um, about the future and I think that uh, the government and uh, private industry, um, both the established and the emerging, are working together in partnership um, with regard to economic development in the future. So I'd like to remind you, if you have questions you'd like to pose to the panel, um, please write them down on a card. Hold the card up. Wendy, uh, will somebody be coming around then? Yep, here they come. So they'll pick those questions up and we'll try and work them into the dialogue as we go. We have a, just a couple of things that um, I think we would be worth kind of starting with. Marty, you started with the notion of turnaround. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is that actually, uh, and, and Debbie, you talked about resurgence. You know, I think that it's kind of a common theme. Uh, it's not too tough to arrive at in some ways because we want something different than we've had in the last couple of years. But is turnaround really the right metaphor? In other words, turnaround, you know, uh, in, in literal a sense, uh, you know, kind of going back to where we were, but can we do that? Or really, do we need to think about the fact that this economy is really different and we're going to a place we haven't been before? Is turnaround the right way to think about it, or are we moving into a new era here for the economy in the state of Oregon? Um, I think, uh, honestly, Ethan, you, 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 can, uh, you can define turnaround in a, in a number of ways. But the fact is, is that we're all looking toward the future, and that's where we have to look. And, and usually when we do that, you have to build upon the base of what you have in your strengths. And as you look towards that future, you make your best guess as to where that's going to go, oftentimes based upon those same strengths. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that... Um, that you, you do grab what you have, you project out to that future. Uh, you always have a creative destruction aspect uh, in business, and, and that's all healthy. Um, I think that if anybody drove down uh, the highway in 1999 um, and passed a big building on the right-hand side in Silicon Valley and saw the eBay building, yep. that you would not have guessed that four or five years later it would have been having a $30 billion capitalization and maybe the largest retailer in the United States. 
Um, that's how difficult it is to kind of guess towards the future. Uh, but um, and, and the future will be uneven. There will be some people that will, will be successful and, and some people won't. That's just the nature of it. But I'm always reminded of John Wanamaker and the television side of things who said that I know that half of my advertising budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and to some degree, I don't mean to be flippant, but you know, you, you, you toss the line out there as best as you can and you make the investments as best as you can. And, and usually the identification specifically of the industries is going to be wrong, but somewhere along the line, you do get it right sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, before we turn to Bill Kramer, our, bo our board host, for, for his question, um, Marty, you mentioned the notion of strengths. Uh, Debbie and Sam, you know, if you had to kind of identify the strengths that this research center w will be based on, what would you say are the two or three strengths that we really ought to be looking to? Well, <clears throat> one thing is that our education system is doing, uh, I think, an excellent job, even though a lot of criticism has been put forward. I think that we are, we, we have to do is really uh, try to attract, like Debbie just said, the graduates from other schools out of the state to come to this uh, city and be part of the ec economic growth. Um, I think we have um, some definite ad advantages which will help fuel the resurgence. Um, number one, I think we have a strong base of professional services here in the Portland metro area. That's everything from major accounting and uh, law firms, executive search, public relations, advertising. Um, I think we have a strong core of that to help support um, emerging businesses. Um, in terms of education, I mean, I, I can't sit up here as a high technology uh, representative and not, you know, um, decry the lack of funding for uh, higher education. Um, I just, uh, I don't know, um, it's, just, it's just unbelievable to me. I, I'm such a, a liberal at heart, I, I f <laughs> and I, I gladly pay taxes. I would gladly pay more taxes to allow every qualified person in this country to go to college. I absolutely would. Um, my, my pa ne neither of my parents got to college, and I got to go on uh, you know, many, many scholarships, including as a war protester, the National Defense uh, student loan <laughs> program, uh, which amazes me to this day that, that those are the ones who got me through college and grad school. But uh, so I, I do think we, I, I think the talent base here is is very good. I know everyone decries the lack of a, um, you know major engineering graduates, but business school graduates. We don't have one of the top 100 business schools in the country. I think even the University of Washington is only about 75th. You know, I come from the the Bay Area where. Um, my God, Santa Clara Jesuit University had one of the best MBA programs in the whole state. So um, I think we need the marketing and sales, the chutzpah talent you get from the, the MBAs that would help us launch some sustainable growth businesses. Great. Thank you. Bill. Bill Kramer. Hi, as a member of the board, I'm, I get uh, the privilege of asking a question of the uh, panel as well. Uh, many people have expressed concerns about the continuing loss of manufacturing jobs in Oregon. Um, given the global economic forces uh, that are contributing to this loss, realistically, do you believe it's possible to restore the manufacturing sector in Oregon? And part two, if so, what should local leaders, both public sector and private sector, be doing? Um. It, 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 it's a complex question, and it, there's a complex answer, but I'll try to simplify it. The, the lack uh, or the loss of, of manufacturing jobs throughout the, the world is happening, uh, well, it's happening everywhere. Um, a November 10th issue of Fortune magazine, a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Colvin reported that even China, which is supposed to be the most where our manufacturing jobs are going, lost 15 million manufacturing jobs in 1995 through the year 2002 versus America's loss of just 2 million. Uh, and so when China is losing manufacturing jobs, I think the, you have to reflect upon Debbie's comment about technology and, and productivity and, and really is that being a major, major factor in this rather than just the low cost labor, which is a part of it too. Ergo the complexity of the answer. 
is it possible for us um, in Oregon, which relies upon manufacturing more than any other Western state, to continue our manufacturing uh, thrust? The answer is, I believe, yes. A modified yes, but yes, it is. There's a reason that a lot of the manufacturing people live here and that they work here. Some of it is because they like to be here. I'll, I'll use an example of, of Freightliner, for example. Freightliner's customer base isn't here, and so they don't have to be here in order to sell their product but they want to be here because of the livability. And they have indicated that they want to expand here in some time in the future, too. So is that manufacturing capability capable of staying here? The answer is, yeah. There's the economic side of it also, because it's just not easy sometimes to ship boxcars from China. And so there are economic reasons that people are manufacturing here also. So again, uh, it's a complex answer, and it's a complex question, but the uh, bottom line of it is, yes, it is possible to maintain, I believe, a manufacturing presence. Will it look like the past? No. But can it be there, and can it be part of our society? Yes, it can be. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about this. There's no place else in the world I'm happier than walking on the floor of a manufacturing operation. Um, I made my name in high technology, uh, running the most successful electronics manufacturing organization in the world. But less than 20 years later, it's irrelevant um, because the technology that we were pioneering in the mid-1980s um, is now replicable all around the world at much lower labor costs. The way I tend to look at manufacturing is uh, similar to the boxcar example that Marty gave. If you take a ton of raw iron and you ship it from, I don't know, Utah to South Korea, and they can transform it into steel using you know water and utilities and ship it back to California for um, the total cost of that, less than the wage differential between Utah and South, South Korea, then it's gonna be done over there. I mean, you have to look at total cost, landed cost, included, including the cost of communications and other hidden costs. But um, the fact of the matter is, is I think that uh, manufacturing is going to go wherever the costs are lower. We have a huge advantage in this country in that we are both near most of the natural resources of the world, um, you know, like iron and uh, petroleum and other things, and also one of the largest end markets for that. But I don't know with China and other emerging markets if that's going to remain true. And I wonder if we aren't romantically hanging on to manufacturing jobs like we held on to farm jobs when things were transforming from an agrarian to an industrial society. If you've ever worked a dull, boring, repetitive factory job, that is not the best way to use human intelligence and dignity, I can assure you. I agree 100% with Debbie here. I, I, I feel that, uh, that we are going to be driven by the service industries and we have to just shift our labor concentration towards that. And unfortunately, unfortunately, like I mentioned in my speech, the Asia giants of cheap labor is just not going to go away. They are getting better, better and better. And like somebody said that they, uh, China lost so many jobs over there, it was true because they're using more high-tech facilities. And it's amazing. I've, I've, tr I've traveled China and amazed at the tremendous factories that are over there. They're about three or four times bigger. I was talking to someone about the plywood factory over there with, with employees, one factory employs over 30,000 people. And it's just Im immense, immense that this country could never, never compete because we don't have the labor market to compete with that. We, we're looking at bi a billion and a quarter population, uh, what, what I think we are, uh, we should not just keep on chasing after manufacturing jobs because it's not going to work in the future. Right now it might be for a little while, but I really think the many manufacturing jobs we have now today, we're just going to go overseas. Great. Bill, did that answer your question? Good. Okay, great. Um, you know, we have a, a, a number of um, questions here about the future, you know, and kind of where we're going and kind of how, what the outlook might be. Um, but, you know, this, you guys sound pretty positive, pretty optimistic. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, would you say that, you know, in general, when people talk about the economy around here, are we, you know, 
too positive, too pessimistic, or about right? <laughs> Can I? Uh, I just want to. Uh, I have a flippant <laughs> answer to that. <laughs> Fine. I. Ninety-two percent of the people have jobs, and they're very happy with the economy. The eight percent that don't have jobs are very unhappy about the economy, and that's where it stands. And nobody really, people who have jobs here, really don't care whether the economy is going up or down, and so on, just as long as they got a job. I'm talking about most people think that way, and uh, and they don't look at the future. Uh, th they have enough problems within, uh, with themselves trying to make a living. And so the 8% that don't have jobs are the ones that are really unhappy about the economy. Well, I have a little <laughs> bit different view. Um, uh, yeah, there's, now those 8%, which um, are cut and dried um, umpteen ways by government statistics, these are the people who are actively very actively looking for employment. Uh, there's another uh, estimate of another two and a half percent of the population that's you know chronically unemployed that doesn't even get into the statistics. Um, but then I have um, just anecdotally among my friends and colleagues, I don't know, maybe another 20 percent of the working population is dissatisfied with their current jobs, afraid of uh, rocking the boat, afraid of coming up with new ideas, uh, afraid of disagreeing with his or her boss. Uh, and I don't think that's a very positive thing for um, growth and innovation. I think the type of service jobs that Sam's talking about are not hamburger flippers. I think they are network installers and uh, database consultants and um, uh, the, like what's called the creative um, part of our industry and the, where the arts and, and graphics and the creative um, industries all um, kind of spur innovation and creativity and growth. So, um, so I, you know, I, to me, if there is one person in the world who is unemployed who wants to work, we've got a problem. I mean, I, I'm sorry, that's the way I look at things. Well, I'm an optimist, and, uh, <laughs> and so I'm gonna approach it uh, slightly differently. And I'm, and I'm kind of looking at the future. Um, I see that we have a fabulous potential here in Oregon. I see, uh, having just come back from the trip in, in Europe with the governor, um, that there's a $10 trillion economy in Europe right now. And the slight efforts that we're making right now in Germany, including the 40,000 people who have purchased round trip tickets in Frankfurt to come to Oregon, yes. it, there's a nice little buzz going on right now about Oregon. But you have a $10 trillion economy in Europe right now, you have a $10 trillion economy in the United States, and you have a $10 trillion economy in Asia. And we're in the middle of that. We've got to figure out a way to take advantage of that. And some of that is being put in place with our international carrier services and other types of things. But we need the infrastructure. We need the roads and, and, and bridges. We need a lot of different uh, things in order to kind of take advantage of just one segment of that. Again, the future is going to be uneven. And it won't be the, the stellar performances, I don't believe, in the manufacturing. I think manufacturing has a role, but the service economy clearly, I believe, is, is part of that future. But the service economy could include health care, and it could include wonderful advances on the health care side, and it could include a lot of other things also. So I'm optimistic about it. I understand that the world is changing. I hope I'm not Pollyannish, but I do believe that we're going to get there, and we're in a pretty good place for it. Well, let's widen the view a little bit. Um, you know, Oregon has chronically actually had relatively high unemployment. Even during the 90s, uh, Oregon had unemployment that put it towards the top of the heap mm -hmm. despite the uh, incredible economic growth that we experienced in the state. And now when you look at the different parts of Oregon, uh, there are many different things going on out there. What's happening in, in Portland, you know, maybe similar in some ways to what's happening in Ashland or Bend, um, but that's quite different than what's happening in, um, you know, in, in Harney County or on the coast. Um, you know, how do we begin to kind of approach this as a, as a state economy, or basically are we at the point in our history where we need to begin to think about it as several different economies? And Sam will take care of that one. I, I thought I started up last one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're probably all familiar with um, the Oregonian series that's going on. It's been fascinating for me as a relative newcomer to the state to learn about, um, uh, I have not been to cowboy territory, I guess, yet. 
Um, I've been to visit all the other um, seven or eight Oregons, but not that one. So um, it's intriguing for me at least to learn about the different um, environments and challenges that are faced uh, in various um, parts of our state. I mean, it's a vastly complex geographic, you know, you know, state and population centers and stuff are, are differently. So um, I'm not an expert on this, but I think it's really important to have the basics um, available to everyone, um, like telecommunication access and um, quality public education and transportation. Um, I don't think you can guarantee everybody, you know, a job or an economic opportunity depending on where they're born, but I think you can offer them, you know, basic life utilities. Yeah, and I, I think that, that that diversity, and congratulations to the Oregonian, by the way, on that series. I think it's a wonderful series as it's developed so far, so um, so I really like to, to thank them for doing that. Um, I, I think that it does illustrate some of the things that, that we in economic development face every day, and that is there is a whole diversity of states and one size doesn't really fit all. You gotta go with your strengths and you gotta figure out what the strength of a particular area is. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to replicate what was done in the past. Agriculture in the future is going to be different than agriculture in the past, but agriculture still can be a viable business. It might be cut flowers rather than growing gra uh, grasses or wheat. But nevertheless, there is a, an, an area in the agricultural sector and in the natural resources and in the high tech and a number of other areas that are going to grow. And, and what we need to do is try to identify those and create the environment to allow that to happen. You know, I, I really feel sorry for most of the state is really, really desperate for economic growth. And we don't, and the state legislature or the powers to be have to figure out ways in which we can help you know, uh, the, the communities that are, for example, in the eastern part of Oregon, uh, the situation is really desperate and people are leaving there. And, so, and, and the only engine we have here in this state is Portland. Portland, I think, furnishes 40% of the education fund with our taxes. And that can't be go, uh, go on. We have to get the rest of the state, the most of the state, I would say as much as 80% of the state is really below the, below the standard of what we expect in Portland. And so th I think that some, somehow or another uh, we have to uh, not just look at ourselves here in this area here in Multnomah County, but let's look at all these other counties that are having a difficult time uh, keeping the population uh, fed and well-being. Well, you know, the comment about, you know, we need to kind of help the legislature, get the legislature, or hope the legislature, or <laughs> wish the legislature, or elect the legislature, or whatever, um, <laughs> raises an interesting question about leadership in a certain sense, which is, and there's a, a, a number of questions here that we've got, frankly, that are kind of saying, okay, you know, kind of prefaced with, you know, for Marty Brantley, which I think is kind of code for, <laughs> you know, um, when will the state do X? But I guess the question is when it comes to the economy and the economic development that Oregon needs, you know, um, the economy isn't, you know, obviously just a public sector kind of responsibility. Um, what is it that appropriately we should look for from the state or from the business community? Um, how would you respond to that? Because I think there is a sense that the leadership is not coming from where it needs to be or something like that. Um, the, the state can do a certain amount, um, and that is the state can create the environment in which businesses can grow and jobs can be created. There is a small part of that that they can re create goods and services, jobs, if you will, for example, in the transportation package, the $2 billion transportation package is estimated that 5,000 jobs will be created. But for the most part, we have 1,700,000 jobs, plus or minus, in the state of Oregon. And the state is not going to employ or, or have a material effect upon that 1,700,000, one except by creating the atmosphere of growth and job creation for those small businesses in particular, but large businesses to grow too. So that's what we've got to do. That's our challenge, if you will, is to listen to the business community and economic growth and to say, what is it that is impeding your progress? What is it that is stopping you from growing? And on a worldwide basis, because that's what we're really competing against, is looking around and saying, what is it that other countries or other states are doing that are helping them grow and we're not too? 
So that's a big part of it. But you also have to in, in, infuse then the livability aspect because I don't think any of us want to destroy the livability at the expense of economic growth. Somewhere in there, there is a blend. And that's, that's the gray area that we all have to debate and talk about and go forward. But if there's one takeaway that I would ask you to do, and that's the livability side, is that we are not going to get to economic health without livability, and we're not going to get to the livability without economic health. So please remember that as you go forward. It's easy to, as, as that un unemployment rate will drop, and it will, I believe, that we're going to sometimes get back to the idea of, oops, now everything's fine, let's forget about economic viability. We cannot do that this time. Debbie? On that one? Well, um, I, you know, my experience, at least in the last nine months, is that um, the state is really uh, spearheading a lot of um, efforts uh, for the private sector. Uh, those of us, you know, in uh, commercially for-profit uh, businesses, uh, to get together. And if there's any uh, group I would single out, it would be the corporate executives of Oregon, and in uh, and in specific, the Portland metro area. I've been here 11 years. I've never met a single executive from Nike. I haven't met executives from some of the Silicon Forest companies I did business with. They, they stick in their offices and they communicate by email. And they don't feel like they have to be part of the bigger community and ensure issues like livability and um, other things. And um, I think that's really bad. I think we have a proactive um, government uh, officials and groups out there uh, really working hard to make this a, a good place to do business in. But I think that the corporate leadership has to uh, do their part as well. So that's who I'd single out for some criticism. I agree with Debbie. I, uh, definitely, definitely the CEOs and presidents and executives of so many companies that are here we near, never hear about. You just see a name in the Oregon business uh, section being number one co company, number two company, and so on, but you never see them out in, in the community. And I think that they, they can certainly help th this state by being ambassadors to try to attract other uh, industries or companies to this uh, state. And so, it's, tr it's true. It's true that uh, they're very busy and they're using email and so on. But I think if each executive uh, on the top level of executives in a, in a well, how many uh, large companies are there, uh, Mari, Mari, today? Uh, something that employs more than 100 people. Um, I would guess, and I don't know the figure honestly, mm -hmm. Sam. But okay. I'm but anyway. Let's say it's a thousand. <laughs> but it could, it could well, it's several thousand. hundred at least. About a thousand. Yeah. Let's say a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. And that they all devoted one hour of the week to, to mm -hmm. promoting the state, promoting, uh, to promoting the, uh, the, the ec economic sense and livability and all those things, one hour a week. Just imagine that's a thousand hours a week. But do, yeah. the, do we have that? No. I mean, we don't. Well, you know, to uh, I got to say, in the defense of a number of business leaders who've been very active, you know, we have the Portland ambassadors who've been very active over the years and trying to kind of uh, reach out to their counterparts, both locally and internationally. But I guess part of what this relates to is um, maybe, uh, you know, kind of a sense of, well, what is this the economy? What economy are we actually operating in? You know, what does it mean now to be, uh, you know, operating in a global economy? Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about manufacturing. Um, how do we compete with places that pay much lower wages? Um, well, how do we create that kind of civic business partnership in an era where, you know, the uh, competitors, the issues, the markets are frequently thousands of miles away? How do we bring that focus, you know, closer to kind of where we are? Well, they say that you should, you know, think global but act local. And if you look at a, a pair of athletic shoes, the cost of producing those shoes in a you know third world factory overseas is minuscule compared to the amount of uh, money that goes to some uh, probably hot-headed uh, young uh, athletic star here in the United States who's being paid you know to support that but then you've got the creative genius geniuses at places like Wyden and Kennedy you've got the distributors I, I, I tend to drive Toyotas and they tend to all be uh, designed in Southern California manufactured in Kentucky you know, marketed on uh, Madison Avenue and purchased by me here on the West Coast, maybe 5% of the profit goes back to Japan. I mean, that, that's what global is. You have to kind of think about, 
you know, where the money flows. Um, there's more money made today tracking the flow of currencies around the world than there is in manufacturing goods. I mean, value is extracted from, you know, all segments of um, flows, not just materials uh, flows throughout the world. So um, I actually think we're pretty well situated in terms of um, a global economy. I, I, I see us as having more uh, pluses um, than minuses in that regard. Well, then how do, we, how do we kind of, you know, make it possible to compete globally and act locally? What is it that gets people out of their offices for an hour a week that makes it, um, makes that economic integration with the social and civic life that you're talking about more real or at least more immediate? Well, I, I realize that I, I was criticizing folks before, but um, George Passador comes to mind to me recently retired uh, top executive for uh, Wells Fargo Bank here. And uh, I think that if all the execs, you know, within our business community, you know, contributed even 50% of, yeah, of what he did the to the community, we realize we're all highly interdependent. Um, and that, you know, one hand feeds the other. Um, um, we're all out there. Um, everyone has different, you know, uh, needs. Um, personally, but uh, economically, you know, we're all the sum of all of those needs, whether they be for um, creative and artistic endeavors or a great restaurant or clothes or athletic shoes. I mean, I tend to buy them, but not use them real well. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't run the marathon and everything, but, uh, you know, there's a certain Well, that's okay. It's like most SUVs it. never get driven off the pavement either. I so, never have know. done that either. <laughs> <laughs> never. I, I, th I think there's a light in the end of the tunnel because Northwest Airlines is considering uh, starting a, a service between here and Tokyo direct, nonstop. Uh, we got Lufthansa fl flying planes. They're filled. Every single flight is filled, uh, and there's waiting. Uh, there's wait list every on every flight, and w and uh, we have we're going to be dredging the uh, river uh, so that it, uh, we can take care of much bigger ships that come in. Is that right? Yes. We're going to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. And right after this lunch, Marty's going to be out there with yeah. the shovels. <laughs> <laughs> so the big ships are, uh, bigger ships are come in. Uh, we, yeah. we, you know, the port gets only about 800 ships in a whole year coming in. And we should be getting at least 1,200 or 1,500 ships to, and to make this port a more active port. And so I, th I think that there are things uh, uh, in the horizon that's going to help our economy in a great way. And we have to be searching for those things, you see. In other words, people that Port of Portland have been working on Northwest Airlines for years trying to get them doing this. And I think it's going to come through uh, probably this spring, mm -hmm. this coming spring. But it, anyway, what I am is I, I, am, I am along with uh, Marty and Debbie that I'm very optimistic about this economy. I think we're going to go. We, we got the talent. We have the talent. We have the means. We have the capital. We have everything. But this putting it all together, it, may, it must be the problem. I don't know. OK, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I agree I, with Sam. I think that there are a lot of things. We, we also have a lot of things to work on yet. Um, there's, there's still some things that are broken, and we, and, and we can't ignore those, too. Um, but, but through it all, I, I do think that we can get there, and we do have the talent, the means, and all of that. Um, I think that there's been a good first step on the transportation package, as I said. And I think that the private sector, including OBC, by the way, which I think is doing a good job and has really provided a nice business agenda for the state, um, and, and, a, and an upcoming meeting, they're in preparations already for, for that next year, uh, what I call the and therefore. Um, uh, so so I, I think that while we have some work to do, I do believe that there are certain aspects of the business community that don't feel part of our community, including some of our manufacturers and small business and high tech and a number of others. We do have to work on that, but we can get there. We, we really can. So, okay. I think there's time for one more round. One more round. Okay. Well, let me just kind of throw this out, and that is, is that uh, in this current recession, we've spent a lot of time thinking specifically about um, the kinds of things we needed to do to stimulate business. But in this conversation, we've talked a lot about the fact that it's the economy, it's the environment, it's quality of life.